Well, welcome to the first annual President's Student Leadership Conference. We're all happy and excited to see you here. Uh, so that we're going to begin by allowing President Dr. Riley to address you and give you some talking points just to welcome you, and then we'll get the program started. Okay? okay. All right. Dr. Riley. All right. <laughs> all right. Thank you, Dr. Lanley. Good morning. Thanks for coming on a Saturday morning. Uh, this is uh, an effort that we've been working on with your student leadership for quite some time. And I got to tell you that part of the genesis for this is some of you have asked me, well, Dr. Riley, did you know you wanted to be president of Downstate? And I said, I didn't want to be president of anything. I just wanted to get out, get into college, get out of college, you know, get into medical school, uh, you know, pass, get past the MCAT, get into medical school, get past step one. So I had very discreet goals. But when, you, when I think about it, sort of retrospectively, um, you know, my path to what I'm doing now started as a student leader. Uh, started in high school. Uh, I was on the student council in high school. Uh, I was copy editor of our yearbook. I was on the newspaper staff. When I got to Yale, I was vice president of Black Student Alliance at Yale. Uh, I was on a university committee at Yale on student, uh, student affairs. Uh, when I went to graduate school, I was president of black graduate students at Tulane University in New Orleans. And when I got to medical school, I was class president three out of four years. Uh, I was president of AMA MSS, the, as president of NMA chapter. So when I think about it, all those little leadership experiences I had as a student, you know, led to the opportunities that I then had in my career. And that's why I think that sometimes we we think that leaders are, are just born, where well, we're not. Uh, you know, leadership is a trained skill. And the, the ability to be a leader, uh, whether it's in your class or an organization, uh, is very important, particularly in the health sciences, where no matter what type of health science profession you're pursuing, when you walk into a room, people are going to give you so much currency because you are a PA or because you're a nurse, or because you're a physician assistant, or because you are a medical informaticist or, or a physician. So that's how sometimes we get pulled into leadership situations just because of our profession. But I've always believed that you know leadership can be taught, that we can all learn to be better leaders. I still learn about leadership. I still read things uh, every week to try to be a better leader. And so even at my whatever level, I can never stop learning about how, how to be an effective leader. So that's sort of the genesis of this discussion. I want to, uh, where's Avi? Avi there, uh, he, he has been uh, really a champion for this whole idea to have this conference, uh, because he and I have been talking since, even before I became president, that I really value uh, students. I'm very student focused in terms of making sure that you guys have a great educational experience here at Downstate. And uh, part of it is uh, to really engage with the student leadership. Uh, because I was you uh, many years ago. And I remember sometimes good interactions with people like me and sometimes great interactions or the administrators who work here. So uh, I try to model that in my presidency to make sure that we always are sensitive to and aware of student input, opinions, and everything. Uh, and at the same time, we have to help you become better leaders because this is not just for here for Downstate, it's for your life. And so that's the genesis of this conference, uh, colleagues. Uh, it's something that I feel passionately about, that leadership is something we desperately need, as you could tell, in this country these days. Um, and uh, we can, we can be, all be better leaders. So thank you for giving up a beautiful Saturday uh, autumnal weekend. Uh, or Saturday, at least, uh, of your weekend to be here. But this is important. And I think you're going to hear some, some good things about uh, leadership and also uh, help you to reflect a little bit about your own leadership journey. Uh, I used to give another talk, Avi, about your leadership journey in healthcare. And I used to go through the fact of, you know, healthcare is chaos. Chaos. I mean, healthcare is just the most chaotic thing. Well, second to politics now. Um, but uh, there is never going to be a time in your professional life where healthcare is going to be calm. So chaos is the new normal. Um, but good leaders 
deal with the chaos. They deal with the conditions that they are working in or working uh, in for, with the people that they're working for in order to give them uh, better health care, better life. So uh, that's always good to keep it in, in that perspective. Um, the other thing is, you know, some very concrete uh, skills that we want you to have. And this, we've worked through this, this program very specifically. So, for example, conflict. Um, conflict is normal. Uh, we have conflict um, in our families. Uh, sometimes there's conflicts in our relationships, but conflicts are not inherently bad. It's how you manage the conflicts that is the important skill. You know, uh, you know, when you disagree with someone, there's a way to disagree with someone without being disagreeable, uh, you know, and being polemical. And so the way to deal with conflict is really a critical skill that you need as a leader. So we have a session on, on conflict and crisis management, which again, will put in context how we should deal with conflict. Conflict is unavoidable, uh, but it, there is a good way to manage it. So we want to give you some good content how to manage conflict. Um, implicit bias. Uh, this is something that's getting more attention that we're all human, we all have biases, all of us. Um, and sometimes the lack of awareness of our biases can be detrimental to people that you're trying to work with or trying to lead. So we're gonna put you through an implicit bias test and it will help to sort of get you, you know, aware that I have a bias against X or a bias against Y. And, you know, as a Southerner, <clears throat> I grew up in New Orleans. <clears throat> Most of my heritage is in the Deep South. When I was a young doctor, I didn't particularly like taking care of patients with strong country accents. That was my bias. And I was called on it one time by one of my attendings, and it really shook me because he was right. I said, I was sort of not mistreating a patient, but maybe not treating as, or being as interactive with that patient because he had a deep country twang. And so that was a level set to me, you know, to catch my bias. And then in the end, I, you know, some of my best patient relationships were with country talking Texans who had deep southern accents. And so here again, my bias, you know, sort of limited me in a way, but after I understood my bias and was able to correct my uh, my immediate reaction to it. I had a great relationship with a lot of uh, rural Texans when I was a young doctor in Texas. So again, we all have biases. So how you deal with it is, is something we're going to talk about. Um, finding the time to lead. Uh, that's a tough one. Uh, somebody looked at my calendar the other day and said, my gosh, I can't believe any one person can do this in one day. And I looked at it and I said, I don't know how I could do it in one day. I mean, so, um, but, you know, we'll give you some sort of techniques how to, you know, how to find the time to lead, because leadership can be um, a little uh, time consuming, um, but there's ways to manage being a leader without, you know, having it take over your whole life. And, you know, there's this concept of work-life balance. Uh, some people believe that in health professions, your, your life is never in balance. You just toggle it back and forth based on condition, time, and family, and responsibility, and significant others, et cetera. Uh, so again, we'll, we'll sort of talk about that. Um, leadership styles. Um, we're going to have a session where we try to get you clued into your leadership style and your personality type. And this is a little bit controversial. There's the Myers-Briggs test uh, that some of you have taken, some of you have not. And so there's a great debate in the social science literature as to whether an implicit, I mean, um, rather a Myers-Briggs is really an accurate um, sort of appraisal of one's um, personality type. And, you know, that debate's been going on for 20 years and probably will go on for another 20 years. But I always thought this tool was very helpful to at least, again, get you aware of, of your personality type and how to interact with other personality types. Now, I have an MBA. One of the first things they did in, when I started to pursue my MBA, they gave us this test, and then they mixed up the groups. And they made sure that the groups didn't have all extroverts. Because think about it. You've been in groups where everybody talks, right? 
Everybody talks, can't get anything done because everybody's talking. And then you've been in other groups where there's all the introverts. And the introverts just sit there very quietly, don't really say much because they're, you know, the extroverts are dominating. And even in relationships, you know, my wife is a strong introvert. She says, I'm a strong extrovert. I don't believe it, but she says that. But it's kind of funny, even with my wife, we, we debate each other as well. That's the way an extrovert thinks about it, Wayne, you know. And so, you know, sometimes, you know, it's kind of funny, even within uh, relationships, uh, just understanding the personality type of your, your partner is very important in terms of how you should uh, think about your relationship and sort of check yourself. So, well, maybe I am dominating the discussion too much. Maybe I said, just shut up if I'm the extrovert in the room. Or let me let the introverts have a chance. Or what I do in meetings, if I go around the room and all the extroverts have gotten everything out, I'll look around the table and say, well, gosh, I haven't heard from you. Please tell me your opinion. So sometimes the skill is trying to inviting the introvert to give their input. Um, so you'll learn a little bit about that. Uh, I really like the Myers-Briggs because at least it clues you into saying, okay, when I walk into a room and I walk into a meeting, you know, I got to assess how many extroverts are here, how many introverts. And, and look, I tell you, there is no best leader. You can't say that the best leaders are all introverts. The best leaders are all uh, extroverts. Great leaders come in both personality types. And I, I'll give you somebody that you probably are aware of. I had, I had the wonderful honor um, during his presidency to go to the White House three times. I met President Obama. I, I, I was in the Rose Garden and President, he had a group of physicians in the Rose Garden when I was president of the American College of Physicians. And he went along the line and he spoke to each of us. And I kind of sized up the president and I realized, my God, this guy is an introverted guy. President Obama is a very strong introvert. But he's the most socially skilled introvert you will ever meet in your life. He knows how to turn it on and give those great speeches and just move us. But I met him and he's a very introverted guy. And then I know one of his close friends from Chicago, he's really a very quiet guy. He's only comfortable with a certain five or six of his dearest friends. He's not the guy that hangs out in the bar every night, you know, in Washington. He's an introvert. But think of how effective he has been as a leader, even though he's a very strong introvert. So I always tell this story. I've had uh, the honor of meeting the president. Another meeting in, in uh, the uh, East Wing in the White House again. And I was talking to the president, and we were talking about health care. And he was listening. He was listening. But he wasn't saying much. And I'm saying, oh, God, when you're talking too much to the president of the United States. But he was taking it in. You know, he was taking it in. And again, another validation that he's a very introverted guy. But Again, no one can say that he's not an effective leader. So I always tell this story, you introverts will run the world, just like Barack Obama uh, did successfully for us. So um, again, these are the type of practical things that uh, Avi and I and Dr. Langley and TJ, uh, you know, we're really striving as we put this day together. So um, I think this is going to be a great day. So keep an open mind, relax. Enjoy meeting people maybe you don't know from other schools, because that's the other part of this. Uh, uh, one thing I'm trying to do at Downstate, we're so kind of scattered, and sometimes we don't come together. We don't have the right physicality to get people together. I'm working on that. So, uh, so anytime we can get people from diverse backgrounds, schools, academic disciplines together, I think it's best for the community. So uh, thank you very much. I want to uh, thank, uh, where's Dr. Seth Lang? He's out there. Uh, Dr. Langley um, did a terrific job. Let's give him a round of applause. Um, uh, Tayyip Rashid, my administrative fellow, a graduate of the public health school. He's my right-hand man in the president's office. He did a great job. Give TJ a hand. And the staff from Student Affairs, uh, see Medea, where's, uh, there she is, okay. Uh, from uh, Student Affairs, let's give uh, Student Affairs folks. And student services out there, they're at the table, uh, but just uh, let's give them a round too. And Howard with our terrific AV crew, they were here all day yesterday trying to get this stuff uh, running right. Howard, thank you. Um, and uh, I think we are uh, almost ready. I think we have our guest speaker almost here.